Hi guys, welcome to biology. Um, today we're going to be learning about photosynthesis and plant reproduction. Um, and the topics we're going to go through are photosynthesis, limiting factors, plant reproduction, and then selective breeding. Now, um, all about me because I am usually not your normal teacher. I'm usually the moderator answering the questions in the chat. And my name is Christiane. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Manchester. Um, I think I want to be a GP, which is why I have this picture up here. Um, but so far, I'm not really sure what I want to go to. I like the broadness of GP land. You get to see a lot of things. But also, I don't know if I want to be in a hospital. It's, it's cool, but standing around for hours on end, I don't think that's my vibe. Um, I also do graphic design um, for my church is what I do. I make graphic design things. And I think my graphic design also helps me to make medical illustrations. So these are one of the illustrations I've made that are actually in a paper that have been published. Um, it's a cross section, so kind of like a cut down the middle um, of your upper um, head neck area. You see that's this is the tongue and you have your kind of your 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 spine here and all of these wonderful structures here. But that's that's all about me. It's a small introduction. I'm Christiana and I'll be taking the rest of the session today. So today's schedule, we have our morning session from 10 to 11.15. We'll have a break um, in between for about five minutes. Then we'll have our first afternoon session from um, 11.20 to 12.30. And then lunch will be um, from 12.30 to 1.15. And then our afternoon session will be from 1.15 um, to 2. Um, I will try to run to time. I'm being on the moderator side. I know people are like, oh, when's the next break and when's lunch? And I'll make sure that we um, deal with that accordingly. As you can see, I'm just setting alarms to make sure that we do have um, these breaks. Maybe if we finish a bit um, earlier, I don't suspect we would. We could have a bit of an earlier break, or if I see that we're still able to continue going, um, I will. And um, yeah, let me check my phone, it's good. But yeah, that's today's schedule. So without further ado, we're gonna go into plants and uh, plant reproduction. So we're gonna learn about photosynthesis, uh, the structure of a leaf, the factors that affect photosynthesis, the limited factors, the structures that we find within a plant, um, asexual reproduction in plants and sexual reproduction in plants. So that's two types of reproduction and, and then selective breeding and then the advantages and disadvantages of selective breathing and um, breeding. Sorry, so some of these you guys have already come across. So we've looked at photosynthesis and um, we've looked a bit about why it's called photosynthesis because photo is light and they use light to, um, to um, make nutrients. Um, hence the word photosynthesis. Um, but yeah, so it's going to go straight into it. So photosynthesis is a process that provides plants with glucose and glucose has many uses in plants. So some of the uses here is that it's used to make cellulose, which is an important structure of the cell walls. Um, that's the outer bit of the cell. So if you have a, a, a plant cell, um, you kind of have the cell membrane and you have that kind of cell wall which kind of keeps it um, you know, protected and you have the vacuole in the middle, keeps it turgid and of course you have your nucleus and your or chloroplast and all the other things that you find in the plant cell. But um, you need um, the glucose to make cellulose, it's different types. Um, that's not something that you need to know at this point in time, but you need to know that glucose makes cellulose, it's in the cell walls, keeps it nice and strong. I mean, it also makes starch, which is a storage form of carbohydrates. So sometimes the glucose isn't used straight away it's kind of stored so it's like when you eat food and you have it stored in your kind of like your fat cells and all of that it's converted so it can use it later so for example um say a plant um that particularly lacks the sun whether it's making the food making food and maybe at night time it won't be doing as much photosynthesis as you don't have as much light it could then use the um stores the reserves to then have that food to keep going it's also used to make lipids, um, use as storage in seeds. So also what we're going to look at is when a seed um, is planted and you have that reproduction, um, almost like an embryo, um, you're going to have that food storage because when you're a seed, you're not going to be photosynthesizing. You're underground, um, you're underneath the seed is here. You have your little shoot, but before your shoot is even formed, you just have your roots being formed and you're going to need an energy store for the roots to be formed for that shoot to come up and then be photosynthesized. And then the last thing it, it is for respiration. It provides the plant with energy in order to carry out respiration. So if we look at photosynthesis um, during it, we can tell that plants produce 
glucose using carbon dioxide and water and it's a process that requires light energy it's something that helps in the conversion of that so if you look over here we have carbon dioxide plus water it's going to glucose and oxygen but on here we can say light energy is required and here is the chemical symbol so we have the cco2 plus c6h2o going into um, glucose and oxygen and something that we did notice last month i believe is that if you do the reverse of this then it's basically uh respiration because you're taking in that oxygen you're breaking it down to carbon dioxide and water and in, in, in addition to taking in glucose but this is photosynthesis so we have carbon dioxide we're adding water in the presence of light energy and it turns into glucose and oxygen uh food for the plant that it can use as stores in the seeds and then oxygen that you can also use for photo um, for a um, respiration which is why uh, trees are pretty important especially um the amazon rainforest um in terms of uh, um um taking in uh, carbon and producing oxygen that's why we really do love trees and we try to keep as many of them as we can as it can take in that carbon dioxide and then give out oxygen now, the light energy required is absorbed by chlorophyll. So this is a green pigment, which is found in chloroplasts in the leaves. So there are two types of pigments, which you aren't expected to know at this stage, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and they kind of absorb light at different wavelengths. That's a bit of physics -y, a bit of chemistry. Um, but what you need to know only is that the light energy, we um, have chlorophyll, which absorbs it. It's green pigment, which is what gives um, kind of leaves the green colorish. I know it's found in chloroplasts in the leaves and that would make sense because the leaves are where um, most photosynthesis will occur. It doesn't occur, it say if it was a plant that had a flower, it doesn't occur in the petals or in the stem and all the other bits of the plant, it's mainly in the leaves. Now um, chloroplasts are an organelle found only in plant cells so you won't find it in anything else. So if you find chloroplasts in a cell you're most likely looking at a plant cell. You'll never find this in an animal cell because we do not require this process of, of photosynthesis as we can get um, energy and food from other means such as just eating. Um, so here's an exam question and it shows um, an organism called um, Euglenia. It's made up only one cell. It lives in ponds and streams and it has um, features of both plants and animals. So we can see we have a nucleus, we have the cell membrane, we have chloroplasts, we have cytoplasm, we have a reservoir for taking in small particles of food, and then we have a whip-like flagellum, so tail, um, for movement. And I was asking us which two pieces of evidence um, suggest that the cell is an animal cell and not a plant cell. So before I even go into this, if you guys just um, uh, scan this code, and then we can start um, the the, the question so we can um, ask which two pieces of evidence suggest the cell is an animal cell and not a plant cell. So I'm just going to wait for us to filter in before we start discussing um, why it's an animal cell and actually not a plant cell, even though it does seem like it is a plant cell. Just check. So if you guys could just filter in, um, this is the code. I'll just wait a second. There's approximately 83 of us in the class. I'd like to get to 40 if that's OK. Guys, please do scan the codes. We have a lot of quizzes later on. We have more questions to be answering. And this is a form of engagement. This is a form of how I can gauge where you are. There are questions that are going to ask your understanding. So the more people we have, the more accurate I can tell um, what things are. I remember there's two pieces of, of evidence. So we're going to need to two answers. I'll just give you guys a second.
Okay, the number's steadily coming up. Come on, guys, let's all filter in. Like I said, so yeah, it's about 83 of us roughly. I'll give it another minute and then we'll just move on and hopefully the rest of you guys will join um, later on. So we're looking for two pieces of evidence that suggest the cell is an animal cell, not a plant cell. So we have things labeled, we have the membrane, the cell membrane, the cytoplasm, the chloroplast, the nucleus, the whip-like flagellum for movement and the reservoir for taking in small particles of food. The things that are available are, it does not have a cell wall, salt cell wall, it has chloroplast, it has a cytoplasm, it does not have a vacuole. Um, so we're not looking at the flagella, we're not looking at the nucleus. Most cells have a nucleus, apart from if you're really super specialized, like a red blood cell, doesn't have enough space for a nucleus, it wants to carry oxygen. Um, it's the small reservoir, the reservoir seeing small particles of food, we're not really looking at that, and the flagellum as well, we're not really looking at that either. So I'm just gonna show the results. So we have most people going for it's not a cell wall, or it does not have a vacuole, which is um, actually correct. So in a plant cell, plant cell usually have a cell wall like I drew in the diagram before, and it has a vacuole which keeps it turgid. And the fact that it has chloroplast could suggest that it could be a plant cell. Um, and the fact that it has a cytoplasm, both plant cells and animal cells have a cytoplasm. So thank you for joining for that bit. So it says, how can you tell um, that from the diagram that the euglena can carry out photosynthesis. So we have a quiz. Can everybody join the quiz? Fortnite Battle Pass, nice. Clyde, Sheree, Priyana, Owen. Again, there is approximately 83 of us today, guys. I know it's a bit early, but it is 10 a.m. Um, we'll try to get to 40 before we start the quiz. Thank you, Priyana, Gizalex, Naga, Clyde, Owen, Akul, Shri, Caitlin Seaton, Ayushi, yes, I remember you, Marja. It's quite interesting being on this side of the uh, screen. You guys can actually see me, I usually just moderate the background. Galapa, Crystal. Let's try and at least get to 20, guys. Just join the quiz. Nothing to lose. Only learning. I don't know who just joined now. Anonymous 13 man. Nice. Better than Anonymous 12 man. Uh, Jack. All right, okay, so I'm just going to get started. All right, so it's asking us, um, how can you tell from the diagram that Euglena can carry out photosynthesis? So what have we talked about in the beginning that lets us know that Euglena can carry out photosynthesis? Something that contains pigments, perhaps? And if so, what thing on the diagram contains um, uh, pigments? Or is this actually just a trick question? It doesn't actually carry out photosynthesis. Are we trying to catch you out? Hmm. The six of us left to answer. Again, guys, please do join the Slido. The code is in the corner. Don't have much to lose. It's a good learning opportunity. Please, please, please join. We have most people answering, just a couple of people kind of wondering. Give it 30 seconds, time pressure. We're going to try to get you to the point where you're in exams that it's very just quick, 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 because especially when you're doing papers, especially GCSE papers, there's some questions where you can kind of think on, on it a bit more and there's some other questions where you can kind of just do it like quick like well and bam, boom, this is the answer. So you can kind of spend more time on those harder marked questions. This is a hard question, but how can we tell from the diagram that it can carry out photosynthesis? What 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 does it have? Or again, does does it not? Does it not? Let's wait till we get to 20. 
one more person. Anybody answer? Picking up. Oh, got to 21. Okay. So we have most people saying that it has chloroplasts. And that is correct. We can tell that it can carry out photosynthesis because of the chloroplasts, because it contains that green pigment that we were talking about, chlorophyll, and that's able to, to take that light energy and, 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 and convert the carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. So if you look at the leaderboard, and we have Maja at the, at the top, she answered it in six seconds. She's just taking, she's probably waiting for all of you guys to, to answer. We have Clyde um, in second, again, with, with very fast time, 10 seconds. And we have Ayayushi, um, who I'm not surprised to see on the leaderboard, uh, uh, with 12 seconds. And then Priya, Priyana, sorry, and Nabiha, um, with a little heart at the end. Uh, they both are in fourth and fifth place with 15 seconds to go. So you guys are doing quite well. Now we're going to go to the next question. Which other cell has a flagellum? Also, um, you can call it a tail. Which other cell has a flagellum? Is it a muscle cell? Is it a neuron? Is it chloroplast or is it a sperm cell? So you guys have looked at this before. I do know I was there. I was moderating. So hopefully most of you guys will get this answer. Um, but yeah, just try and imagine it in your mind. Is it a muscle cell? Do we have muscle cells with little flagellums um, kind of? waving about in our brain do you have neurons with little flagellums um, kind of waving about do you have chloroplasts and plant cells or is it the sperm cells that have the flagellum tail think think of what these things are um what their purpose is what we're trying to do right we need a tail do you think our muscle cells will need a tail our neural will need a tail chloroplasts will need a tail sperm cells will need a tail Gonna try and get to 30 and pushing it and pushing. There's more people. Come on, guys, answer, answer, answer. Maybe you can take over and disrupt the, the leaderboard, get to first place if you answer super, super fast. It's three more people. I know I believe in you guys. And I'm gonna say most people are going for the right answer. You have like 89% of people going for the right answer. You see me looking over because my phone has the owner. Oh, I do Okay, so one second, guys. Oh, no. So I don't have a window, so I'm doing it from another. From another. Um, one second. I'm doing it from another device because I don't have um, a leaderboard, so to say. Um, input it into my actual um, PowerPoint because you need Windows for that. And I don't have Windows, I have a MacBook. So now I was using my phone, it kind of kicked me out of what I was doing. So I'm going to try. I know you guys have answered, apologies. I'm going to try and get back in it so we don't mess up the leaderboard. Okay, I can do it from here instead. Okay, so I'm going to show the results. Great. Oh, Crisis averted. So we have most people answering the sperm cell, with a couple people answering chloroplasts and muscle cells. Zero percent of people answered neuron. And the right answer, I can tell you, is in fact the sperm cell. So when you think about what a sperm cell is supposed to do, um, it's essentially trying to get to the egg for fertilization. And the way it could do that is having a tail which allows it to move towards that egg cell. So sperm cell was the correct answer in this example. Now, if you look at the leaderboard, Maja is still on top. We have her with 13 seconds. She's going really fast. Priyana and Nabiha have both moved up um, with 20 seconds um, between um, each. Clyde, hi Clyde, welcome to the leaderboard with 20 seconds and an anonymous 13 man, uh, something better than an anonymous 12 man. Uh, is with 29 seconds. So we're going to go to the next question. Now we have many plants 
and make starch um, from glucose. So what group of nutrients uh, do both glucose and starch belong to? So is it vegetables? Is it just food in general? Are they both carbohydrates or are they both proteins? So we need to think which group of nutrients do glucose and starch belong to? And I see many people answering. I'm glad it's working on my iPad. Again, we can get to 30. Maybe more of you guys could join. It's a good quiz. It's a good quiz. I mean, the prize is knowledge. Um, <laughs> we don't give any online quiz uh, answers. We're going to get to 30. Oh, we're past it. So the results, let's see what people are voting for. So we have most people voting for carbohydrates, most people voting for pro, um, then people voting for proteins, and then it's an even split between vegetables and food. I can tell you the correct answer is, in fact, carbohydrates. They are both carbohydrates. They aren't proteins, unfortunately. Um, and um, they are in food, but they aren't just food and you can find um, starch and glucose and vegetables but but the main group of nutrients that we say that they belong to are in fact carbohydrates they are both carbs um, and that's why you kind of need to make sure you're getting those carbs in because they provide you with the glucose and the starch um, which we don't really use that much actually plants are much better at only kind of using starch now if you look at the leaderboard maha is still still on top um, with 23 seconds, really, really fast fingers, well done, Marja. Then we have Priyana, um, who is uh, with 28 seconds, second place. Um, Clyde still hanging in there, 32 seconds. Anonymous Man has moved up to fourth place with uh, 37 seconds. And welcome, Shri, to the leaderboard. Um, you're in fifth place with 39 seconds. So the next question we have, oh, um, and that's actually... Oh, oh no, don't answer, guys. Don't answer. Sorry, that's going to be the next one. The way, um, yeah, sorry, the way it works, it's a bit, it's a bit odd. Sorry, um, that's actually my bad. Ah, so there's one question that you may have answered just a bit earlier before I actually explained what it was, but that's okay. We're going to keep moving on. So now we're looking at the structure of the leaf itself. I'm just checking to make sure that we don't have any more sliders. Okay, cool. So here we have structure of the leaf, and this is the top, this is the bottom, and it's basically um, adapted for photosynthesis to occur. And um, that would make sense. You want it to be as optimized as possible to carry out this process because it can be inefficient at times. You want to make sure that you have um, the minimum effort and um, kind of a maximum um, result, maximum output. So this is a diagram below with the structure. So here at the top, we have the waxy cuticle. Um, then if you go below that, we have the upper and lower epidermis. So this is the upper, this is the lower. We have the... Um, Salicylate um, mesophyll or palisade mesophyll, and then spongy um, mesophyll, and then we have the waxy cuticle um, on the bottom. Um, these are the guard cells, and this is stoma. So this is basically a hole. So if you think about medicine, um, there are things where people have colostomy, so they have their colon kind of taken out. Um, we produce an artificial stoma, a hole, an opening, and to kind of let that out. So stoma just means an opening. Now, the reason why they probably um, um, leaves will need a stoma um, is that, um, as you can see, a waxy cuticle, you think of wax and water, they don't really mix. The wax can't really go through the plant. So you need the stoma to allow water and all these nutrients in the air, um, oxygen, carbon dioxide and whatnot to, to leave and oxygen to go in or to be produced and, you know, for, for um or the leaf and when it's photosynthesizing. So that's why you have the stoma, it allows things in and out. The guard cells, like if you think of a guard, guards kind of protect something, guards kind of get in the way of when you want to do something. If you're trying to protect like a uh, 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 priceless tiara, you're not going to leave it unattended, you're going to have guards. So if you want to get to the tiara, so to speak, you have to get through the guards. So the guard cells kind of restrict when things can come in and out of the cell. And then we'll talk more about the spongy and the palisade mesophylls and as well as the upper and lower epidermis. So the cuticle, that's a thin waxy layer 
on the upper part of the leaf. Um, it protects the leaves while allowing light to pass and it also reduces water loss from the leaves. So as I said, um, it doesn't really let water in. It also does the converse of that. It doesn't let water out. So if the plant is kind of getting that water that it needs for the photosynthesis, it makes sure that it's kept in. It'd be very inefficient if the plant is taking in water and it loses water straight away. So say you have um, uh, 100 milliliters of water is taken in. It's probably really big. You have 100 milliliters of water. If the plant then loses 99 milliliters of that water, you're only left with one milliliter, you're not going to have that much photosynthesis. Like photosynthesis would occur, but um, you wouldn't have as much of, of the production of the glucose and the, and the, car and the oxygen if you had the full uh, 100 milliliters. So the cuticle is very important for the fact that it, although it doesn't let water in, um, it, it lets, um, doesn't let water out. Um, and it's very thin and it basically protects the leaves, but because it's just a thin waxy layer, usually see through, um, you still let light kind of come through to the leaf itself. So photosynthesis can occur because if it was quite thick, um, waxy and light wasn't able to get through, even though you had the water, you had the carbon dioxide, you need that light energy for the conversion of those products to, um, to, um the glucose and the oxygen so it's very important that's a thin it's a thin waxy layer now you have the epidermis um which is basically the the top layer and it's just a thin again transparent layer of cells so you're letting light pass to the palisade cells which is quite important because as you can see they contain something green and that's probably going to be your chloroplast filled with chlorophyll so the top two layers are essentially um see-through so light can go through and, and get to the palisade cells. So that's your epidermis. You also have epidermis in, in, in like your, your skin. You have different layers, five layers of your skin cells, um, which we may go into another time if we look at the skin. But for now, we're just looking at leaves. So the epidermis is the, 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 the top layer. It's not the outermost layer, but the top layer when you're going inside of, of, of the cells. And it allows light to go to the palisade cells, which is very important. Now our palisade um, layer, um, it's called the palisade layer because we have palisade cells which are in it um, and they are, as you can see, towards, so this is the top of the leaf, this is the top and this is the bottom. Um, it's packed towards the top of the leaf, so it's, it's at the top, so the light doesn't have far to travel, um, it's shorter distance and it contains as many chloroplasts as it can, it takes part with many, 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 many chloroplasts. And um, because you have this kind of arrangement of them being packed in and being squashed in, it essentially increases the surface area um, of, of this layer and that allows for more light energy to be absorbed. And having an increased surface area is very important. Now, if you think back to chemistry, I know you're doing, you're doing biology, but if you were to have a reactant, for example, and um, if you had a solid versus one that was kind of powdered, you'd go for the powdered one because it has a bigger surface area, which means there's more places for the reaction to take place. Just as in chemistry and in biology and chemistry, they're very like akin to each other, very similar to each other, like sisters. Um, in this sense of the um, palisade cells being quite packed in together, you have a larger surface area, so you have um, more chances of, of, of photosynthesis to occur for it to be catalyzed and for more chances of light kind of covering this whole area. Now the next layer down is the spongy layer and it basically has um, um, air spaces between it um, so carbon dioxide can diffuse through the leaf. You don't want to keep all that carbon dioxide inside of it. It's like us when we breathe in um, with respiration, we have our oxygens coming in and then it kind of goes into our lungs, into the blood, cycles through, the blood comes back and then you have carbon dioxide and it comes back through. You breathe out carbon dioxide, you don't want to have all that carbon dioxide in there because then you won't have space for oxygen and it's kind of, it's not good um, for us, not really good for the plant. So it has air spaces to allow the carbon dioxide to kind of make its way out through the leaf and um, it enters through spaces um, known as stomata. Um, so those are the gaps. And this is the layer where gas exchange occurs. So just as I said, we have our lungs, 
where gas exchange is occurring, we have oxygen and the carbon dioxide being put in and being brought out. The spongy layer is essentially the lungs of the plant. That's where gas exchange is occurring. Now we have the stomata and the stomata is found in the epidermis. So if you look again, it's found in the epidermis and it's surrounded by guard cells. Now, as you can see, these are the guard cells and they basically open and they close. And like I said, if you're guarding a tiara or guarding something very precious, they basically control gas exchange in the leaf. And depending on how turgid the guard cells are, so how firm they are, the stoma will either be open or closed. And there's two conditions. So there's light conditions and there's dark conditions. So if we look at light conditions, the guard cells will have um, water being absorbed by osmosis. That's the movement of water. And the stoma will be quite turgid and open. So it's so full that it kind of like bulges. It's like if you have an inflatable and you're blowing air into it, it will be quite firm quite turgid and it, closed, it causes it to be open. So then you have as much um, gas um, coming in as possible and being taken out because you're going to have um, an increased amount of carbon dioxide being taken in, oxygen being produced, so you kind of need to be open. But in darker conditions, the, the guard cells would then lose water by osmosis, so the water moves out of the guard cells and then the stoma, because of this, as, as a result of this, are blasted or very um, 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 sloppy and, and they essentially close because you, you don't want that um, gas to be, to be left. So just remembering the um, you have um, the different parts of the leaf. You have the cuticle at the very top, that's the thin waxy layer. Then we go down to the epidermis, which is again just another transparent layer of self which is very important because you want that light to get through to the important layer that uh, the palisade layer where the, uh, the actual reaction of photosynthesis occurs with packed to the brim with chloroplasts. But underneath that, we have the spongy layer, essentially the lungs of the leaf where we have that gas exchange occurring. And then we get to the stomata, which are found in the epidermis surrounded by the guard cells. They help um, control the um, intake and um, output of, of oxygen and, and the carbon dioxide. In. Just depending on what conditions you are, it will either be turgid and open or flaccid and closed. So turgid, think firm, flaccid, think soft. And um, that, that, is, that is how the gas exchange is controlled. Now to summarise, again, we have again at the top waxy cuticle. We have the upper and the lower epidermis. And then we have the palisade mesophyll, which is where photosynthesis occurs. The sponge mesophyll, which is essentially the lungs, of the leaf, which we have um, gas exchange occurring. And like I said, we have a low epidermis, which contains the guard cells, which essentially when they bulge, um, they are open and, and turgid, but when flaccid, they close and essentially close this off so you don't have um, 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 the gas either coming in or coming out um, due to the dark conditions. Now, so we need to order the words to describe the process by which glucose is made in the leaves. So if I scroll and I press play, this works. So we have some words. Hopefully you guys can see it. We need to order the words by which glucose is made in the leaves. So we have we have uh, an equation. So two things come together in the presence of light energy to produce something and something else. So what is what is what comes together to produce glucose? Now there's only five of us or a couple of us. I'll wait till we get to 20-ish and then we can kind of see, or maybe even 30, but we will continue, we'll continue. The last time we had about 34 votes, I think we could get, I think we could even beat 34 possibly, but how, how is glucose made? We have two things coming together in the presence of light energy. It's very important. Light energy must be present. It's kind of a catalyst, um, if, you, if you'd like to say that, in the presence of light energy, and it forms two things. We're all 30 people already. I think we can get to 35. Am I pushing it? Maybe a little bit. 
Are we going to, oh, 32. Okay, there's three more, two more, two more to 30, one more. Wow, you guys are really showing up. Yeah. One more person to, uh, oh, okay, we're past it. We're going to show the results. The carbon dioxide and water becomes glucose and oxygen. And that is what, that is what we see. All right, so we're going to stop this. Well done, guys. Now I'm going to ask you, how comfortable are you right now with photosynthesis? So now that we've kind of gone through it, how comfortable are you with photosynthesis, with what actually occurs with what's happening? So the average score is 4.5. You have some people still at 2. I'm sorry about that, of people um, at 3. Some people at 1 um, may not feel confident. But again, like I say in my other sessions that I do and carry out with other year groups, that it's very, very important that you continue to, so we have the average score being 4.4. The majority of you guys are in this higher end, which is great, which is good. I'd say just because you're comfortable, don't stop going over the topic itself. Um, everyone who's kind of in the lower um, end of this um, of this rating, I'd say I'm sorry. Um, I hope that um, as time goes on, it, it will get easier. Um, I it took me a while to get photosynthesis. It took me a while to get most things in biology. But then I did you know, biology from year seven to year eight to year nine. And I did GCSE biology. Then I went on to do A-level biology, which is why these things seem a bit easier for me. So the more time you spend kind of going over a subject, the easier it will be for you. So don't worry. Um, you might not get it now, but you will eventually get it. Um, um, it, will, it will make sense. I'm just going to close down the poll for now and go back to the um, PowerPoint. So our learning objectives were photosynthesis and the structure of relief, and we've achieved that. We know that photosynthesis is uh, carbon dioxide and water come together in the presence of light to form um, glucose and oxygen. We also know that the structure of the leaf, we have the, uh, um, the epidermis um, up and lower, we have the palisade cells, the spongy cells, and then we have these guard cells and the stomata, and we know the guard cells are flaccid, um, in the dark and closed and turgid and firm and open in the presence of light to have water moving in and water moving out. So now um, we know what photosynthesis is. Um, we know that it occurs um, in, in um, the um, palisade um, layer with the chlorophyll. Um, we now need to measure the rates. This is where a bit of chemistry kind of comes in. I like the overlap between biology and chemistry. I always find that to be the best bits. So now we know what photosynthesis is and we have the production of oxygen, um, the removal of carbon dioxide and the production of glucose. These are things that we can now use to measure the rate. So there are several ways, as you can see in these three examples, of measuring the rate of photosynthesis in the lab. So we have the rate of oxygen output, um, the rate of carbon dioxide uptake, or the rate of carbohydrate production. And we know that we can look at oxygen output because photosynthesis produces oxygen. So if we measure it, it will start at zero. And if you like kind of have a graph of this, oh, that's so wonky. Oh no. Let's try that again. Less wonky. So we have oxygen, it will, obviously it will start at zero and it will go up and at that point it will probably plateau because, because we'll probably reach the, the maximum oxygen output. Like it, 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 I don't think it constantly stays up, but we would measure um, the increase of oxygen because we start at zero and it increase. If we have carbon dioxide, um, we'd have kind of a certain amount and measure how much is taken up. And again, we can do the same thing with the carbohydrate production. So these are three ways of measuring photosynthesis in a lab, measuring the rate, how fast the reaction is actually taking place. But when measuring the rate, there are things that can affect how quickly the rate is carried out. So here we have four different factors. Before I go on and tell you what the factors are, based purely on the pictures, can you guess what these four factors would be. So I don't really have a, a quiz for this, uh, uh, something for you to answer, but just as you are, wherever you are, 
just think to yourself, we have four pictures right now. What, what will it be? So we have the sun, we have calm down outside again, we have the thermometer, what do thermometers measure? And then we have a leaf, which is quite green, and it might probably have to do with a pigment that turns the leaf green, and I've given that away. Um, but I'll let you think for just another 10 seconds, what factors affect the rate? So I hope you guys are thinking, you're thinking, you're thinking. And I'm just going to reveal, I'm going to put you out in misery. So we have several factors affecting the rate of photosynthesis. We have the light intensity. So again, I said photosynthesis is the conversion of carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light to form um, the, um, the glucose and oxygen. So light intensity will play a big part in that. Also, the concentration of CO2 would affect the rate. So if you have a high concentration of CO2, the rate will probably go much, much faster than you've had a lower rate of CO2. Also, the temperature affects the rate of photosynthesis because effectively the chlorophyll, um, it, it um, essentially is kind of like um, um, uh, an enzyme in a sense. It's, it's, it is a natural substance. So if the temperature goes too high, um, you're effectively denaturing these, these proteins, I, sh I should say, it's a protein, and you're affecting that structure of the protein, so it won't be able to function as it should function. Um, that's more of a lock and key method. So you know you have your primary, your secondary, your tertiary structures of proteins. Um, the temperature will affect that, that, that 3D structure, which will affect the job that's doing. And also the amount of chlorophyll will also affect the rate. So the more chlorophyll you have, um, the more um, availability you have for the reaction to take place, the faster the reaction will take place. So those are the factors that affect it. And we're going to look at um, um, what a limiting factor is. So a limiting factor essentially is factors that are also able to limit the rate. And when we talk about limiting the rate, it basically can slow down or effectively stop the rate of photosynthesis from increasing. So if we have our... So you have kind of like different orders of rates and that's more chemistry and you don't really need to know that at year seven um, or year eight at this kind of level. But say you have um, this, um, the sum's going to appear there, this being like the rate of reaction, that's quite steady. You have other things that kind of like increase, um, but eventually, effectively, um, a limited factor can cause kind of the rates from being like kind of steady or kind of, um, kind of um, increasing like this to actually kind of going like this and then the rate is essentially zero so it's, it's stopped it's kind of constant um so because these are limiting um factors it can happen where there isn't enough carbon dioxide so if you don't have enough carbon dioxide even if you increase the amount of light even if you increase the amount of chlorophyll present until there is enough carbon dioxide, um, the rate of reaction will not increase any further. So this is what the next point is saying. So no matter how much the light intensity is increased, the amount of carbon dioxide will not allow the rate to increase any further. So if you look at chlorophyll, I said there were two pigments, there's chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Um, that allows it to absorb um, different wavelengths of light. So if I believe, if I recall correctly, chlorophyll A absorbs blue and then chlorophyll B um, absorbs red wavelengths of light. And because it absorbs the red and blue wavelengths of light, it reflects green light. So you think, wait a minute, I thought it was green because it absorbs green light. And basically light, um, it's it, so white light isn't purely white light. Um, white light is made up of a mixture of colours. Um, so we have the R, um, G, B, so we have red, green, blue. That's kind of the, like if you work in like, so I work in like kind of graphics and things like that. You kind of have the R, B, G seconds. So if you increase a more of a red or less of a red, it, it kind of turns into different colours depending on what values you give those three numbers. So because effectively chlorophyll is um, it's white light, as we said, is given in red, blue and green, and the chlorophyll is only absorbing the red and the blue, so it's effectively taking that out of the white light. 
all you have left is the green um, aspect of the light, which eventually, which essentially just goes back out, which is why we view um, chlorophyll as green, because that's what it's given out, which is quite interesting. And if you're more interested in it, you should totally look into it, the RBG values and all of that. But um, some plant diseases basically cause um, the amount of chlorophyll that you have in the plant itself to, to be decreased or, or not to be as much as it should be. So the plant would not be able to um, photosynthesize as it should. So um, plants in lower lighting conditions synthesize more chlorophyll to absorb the light required. So if there's not a lot of light, um, the plant is really smart. It'll be like, okay, there's not a lot of light and I need to maximize the amount of light that I can get into myself in order to facilitate um, photosynthesis. The plant doesn't think like this, but this, if we were to say the plant had a thought pattern, this is what it would be thinking, okay, not enough light, I need to maximize the amount of light that I can get. Okay, more chlorophyll, more chance, more, more likely, the, the, the increased likelihood of me absorbing more light into. If you have a plant in lower lighting conditions, it will produce more chlorophyll so it can absorb the light that is needed. Now, when you look at light um, and light intensity um, and the intensity, so you have the rate of photosynthesis. And I said um, you have this kind of, of, of curve where you have the rate steadily increasing. It increases, it increases, it increases. And then you reach to a point where it kind of plateaus, it, it levels out. And at this point, no matter how much you increase the light intensity, the rate of reaction will not budge. So at this point, the light has effect effectively become a limiting factor and unless you increase a different factor such as carbon dioxide or um, maybe temperature or, or, or chlorophyll um, it won't increase the rate of photosynthesis so like I was explaining as the light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis is increasing but until there's another um, until there is another limiting factor where the the rate becomes constant. So this has now become its limiting factor. It's now, no matter how much I increase, it's like I'm going from, I think lights are measured in watts. It's like if I'm going from kind of um, zero watts to like 10 and 20, 30, for example, say this is 30, as soon as I get to this point, even if I increase all the way to 100, 110, maybe even 1,000, it's not going to make a difference as now this has become the limiting factor. So something else has to change for the rate of photosynthesis to increase. Again, the same thing um, happens um, for carbon dioxide. So we have the rate of photosynthesis, we have carbon dioxide concentration. Um, as the amount of carbon dioxide increases, the rate of photosynthesis also increases until it becomes a, a, a limiting factor, uh, another limiting factor when the rate becomes constant. So me increasing the carbon dioxide concentration, doubling it, tripling it, times it by a thousand, times it by a million will not make a difference because I have now reached this point where I've basically effectively gone to the max of, of of what my carbon concentration, of concentration can do to the rate of photosynthesis. So it keeps increasing, it's increasing, increasing. At this point, it plateaus. The rate of photosynthesis is now constant. It's effectively zero and it does not increase. It stays steady, stays the same. So me increasing the carbon dioxide will not make a difference. So at this point, I have to increase or change another factor for the rate of photosynthesis to increase. Now, temperature is a bit of a weird one. It's not like, so in the past few diagrams, we've seen that uh, this is, again, it's not quite straight. Uh, sorry, let's adjust this tablet. So here we have the, um, we had both the carbon dioxide and light intensity kind of went like this. It went up, 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 and then it just plateaued. Now, photosynthesis is controlled by enzymes, and enzymes are uh, proteins which um, effectively um, kind of speed up rates of reaction. They're kind of biological catalysts. Um, in the terms of enzymes, because they're proteins, increasing temperature can kind of give them an increased rate of reaction. It kind of can produce them to work faster, but it comes to a point where that like, you get too high 
the bonds that are holding the enzymes together, making it do the work that it needs to do, eventually um, kind of loosen and denature. The nature is the word that we use for it. It essentially denatures. So now the enzyme isn't shaped how it's supposed to be shaped. It's not going to be able to fit the job that it needs to do. And the rate will now decrease as a result of the temperature now being too high. So now instead of getting this kind of graph where it increases and kind of plateaus stay constant, we have a graph where it goes up, 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 up. We reach this peak or as we can also call it the optimum temperature. This is where you'd want the temperature to be in terms of the rate of photosynthesis. But once we pass that optimum temperature, which is like here, it just goes down, 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 down. And then we have no photosynthesis happening as the enzymes have denatured and the activity um, will not be occurring. It will, it will be it will be less than it, it should be. So the rate of photosynthesis um, increases as there's increasing collisions between the enzyme and the substrate. So like a lock and key method. So it's like if I have an enzyme like this, this is the enzyme, this is the substrate, it can go inside, it fits, it then causes kind of, if it's kind of supposed to break down things, it will cause it to now be like this. We now have it broken from the rectangle to the two squares. Now, at increase in temperature, the enzymes will now denature and the activity will reduce. So say we had the enzyme, which was supposed to be drawn like this, and this is our substrate. You see this fits. If our enzyme now kind of looks like this, because it's now denatured, the, the, the shape of it is changed, this block is not going to fit in there. Because of that, because of the temperature changing the shape of the enzyme, the activity is now going to be reduced because you don't have as many enzyme substrate complexes being formed. That is what is kind of driving the rate of reaction. I know these are kind of a bunch of big words. Enzy enzyme substrate complex is just the enzyme and the substrate coming together. So because the temperature kind of changes these bonds within the protein structure, because enzymes are proteins, it now causes it to change its shape. It might not be as simple as this, it might be a bit more um, complex, but if we're to, to put it into basic terms, put into basic objects, it changes from this shape, which allows this to fit in, to this shape, which does not allow this block to fit in as it's just not, it's not made for that anymore. Which is why you have to be quite careful with temperature, because the higher you go, the faster the rate of reaction, but if you go too high, the enzymes will now denature and it won't be doing what you want it to do. So in summary, if we look, we have the light intensity. Um, as you increase it, keep increasing, 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 it comes to a point where it becomes a limiting factor and you now have to increase something else to increase the rate of photosynthesis. The same thing occurs with carbon dioxide concentration. You're increasing it, increasing it, increasing it, then it comes to a point where it is now the limiting factor and you have to now increase something else. But with temperature, you can increase it, increase it, increase it, increase it. You get to your optimum temperature. But once you get past that point, it now decreases the rate of photosynthesis and you will now have to kind of change something else to increase the rate. So limiting factors, as we said, can either um, decrease or slow the rate of reaction. So here we have a slowing of the rate of reaction and here we have the decrease of the rate of reaction. So now I'm going to ask you, how confident are you on limiting factors? If I put this up on here, um, on limiting factors, how confident are you? We have a couple of people being confident. That's good. That's good. That's good. I'll give you a second for you guys to answer. Oh, don't do that. OK, OK, we have that from the show results. So we have a majority of you um, being confident in limiting factors. We do have a small percentage of you not being so confident. And that's OK. Like I said, again, it takes time for you to kind of go through these things and understand. But um, limiting factors are just essentially something that can basically stop 
or slow the rate of reaction. We have the three examples. We have carbon dioxide, we have light, and we also have temperature. We also have the amount of chlorophyll, but we didn't look into that too much. But I guess the more chlorophyll you have, the faster the rate of reaction, but it comes up to a point where that even increasing the amount of chlorophyll won't increase the rate of reaction. Um, so I'm just going to stop presenting that for now and move back to the slide. So we are moving quite quickly, we're doing quite well. So we've looked at factors affecting photosynthesis and the limited, the limited um, factors. So we have factors that affect us, we have chlorophyll, we have rate of photosynthesis, I mean, sorry, light density, carbon dioxide con concentration, and then the temperature, the limited factors and limiting factors are um, based below. So now for the last 15-ish minutes, I'm going to look at the audience Q&A session, um, session. We're going to have that and then we'll take um, a break.